This feature is brought to you by JPHMP Direct, the companion site of the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. All right, thanks for joining me on episode two of Views from the Front Porch podcast series about physical activity in rural America. My name is Christian Abilto. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health at West Virginia University. I am joined for this episode by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Mike Edwards from North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Edwards. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's awesome to get you, get you on screen here. Um, would you um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the reasons uh, you're interested in rural physical activity and, and research on it? Yeah, um, so my background is I grew up in uh, rural eastern North Carolina, um, you know, went to um, Chapel Hill as an undergrad, worked in sports uh, for a, a bit, came back to grad school, and really got interested in, in sort of focusing research on uh, sport participation, physical activity, and I, I really got a sense early on in the research in this area um, that not a lot of the um, the research we were doing was really resonating with, with my experiences in rural um, communities. And so I felt that I had something to add into that conversation. And that really sort of got me uh, excited about being able to do uh, research focused in, in rural communities. So you talked about sport and physical activity. So the big, the, the most important question here is uh, what's your favorite type of physical activity or sport? <laughs> yes. So I, I used to play soccer um, and that was before my kids started playing soccer. Now I drive them um, to soccer. <laughs> Uh, and, and back. Um, but I have a, a men's um, uh, workout group called F3, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, sort of a faith-based uh, boot camp, uh, volunteer-led workout uh, that's, that happens uh, most, uh, uh, almost every morning uh, around 5.30, 5.45 in the morning, so it actually fits my schedule uh, that makes me get out of bed early. Uh, but it's, you know, 45-minute workouts, a lot of good banter and accountability and, and all that, and uh, uh, what we call mumble chatter. Uh, a lot of a lot of sort of uh, ragging each other a bit, so uh, so it's a lot of fun. That's probably the the the, mo the best way to get me out of bed to do physical activity these days. Uh, that fits in my schedule. <laughs> that is not easy. <laughs> no. Um, so you know, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we've worked on in the past together with a bunch of our uh, fellow colleagues from around the country, and, and that uh, call to action paper published about rural active living. Um, you know, that was back in 2016. You were, you were heavily involved in it, obviously. Um, so give us a little background on why you were interested in being involved in that paper. Yeah, you know, it really did stem um, from, you know, starting to go to active living research conferences. Um, I, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a dissertation grant um, from ALR um, that, that really got me engaged. I was working with um, some projects that were funded uh, through with uh, Michael Canters and Jason Bacar working on my dissertation. And so I got a chance to start going to uh, active living conferences and um, great stuff, a lot of exciting uh, projects and research being done, and, and, I, and, I, and I know that there was a group of us that uh, kind of came together. As we, again, uh, we started seeing a lot of things that were, were fantastic um, in terms of interve in, in interventions in a rural community, and, uh, and sort of not seeing a lot of rural research, not seeing a lot of attendance at some of the research uh, presentations that were around rural, and a lot of emphasis in, in sort of urban areas, which again, not to diminish the work in urban areas at all, uh, but just felt that there was a, a missing um, sort of gap, and, and not just in the research, but but the application of, of some of the research. So the, you know, the idea that oh, we'll just we'll just sort of scale this down and put it into a rural community, um, and not thinking about that unique rural context. So I, so I felt uh, pretty strongly, as as I know some of the colleagues did, that that it was it was a good time. So let, let's sort of set out this agenda of what needs to be done if we really want to, um, you know, design intervention as um, a better chance of, of succeeding in promoting physical activity in, the, in these rural communities. And I sort of felt that, that the time was right for that, that call to action paper because of the sort of um, the momentum that was, was coming in that, um, with that, that sort of subgroup of, of researchers that, was, that were excited about rural re physical activity research. Awesome. So you talk about the agenda that was put forth and, excuse me, there were, you know, essentially eight calls to action in it. And, you know, 
Um, you could talk about all of them probably, but <laughs> you, you've had some recent work that really hits on a few of them. Um, one of them is about defining, you know, one of the three key points I think that, that comes up is, you know, defining rurality. Second one, um, I think it was point four in our, in our paper was uh, using qualitative studies. And then the last one we had was, you know, capitalizing on natural experiments, partnering really with local groups. So, um, and I know you, you've done some work on sports. You've been talking a little bit about it, youth sports and baseball in rural North Carolina. So you want to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe how you hit those calls to action in, in that work you did? The idea of sort of defining rural is, is something that's evaded, um, I think, researchers for a long time. And, and, I, and I, part of me has been in some of my earlier work uh, with just the, the fascination uh, of how little emphasis has been on, on trying to understand the, the different rural contexts and how we define that. Um, there, there always seems to be this this need to other rural as rural you know versus that, um, and and there's a lot of um, as we know uh, fine grain within rural that 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 it sort of evades um, uh, clean definitions like that, and, and so um, and a lot of times of just the assumption of rural has been very interesting. So um, and it, it kind of for me fits a little bit with that that need for more qualitative research because I think we 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 do need to understand more about those unique nuanced context of different types of rural areas um, as we're trying to develop this more comprehensive um, defining of rural because we know rural New England looks a lot different than the rural south for example and and so you know it really help sort of you know illuminate some of these um, sort of uniqueness and whether that's around um, you know industry whether that's around uh, level of population whether that's around culture whether it's around race racial ethnic uh, populations um, sort of helping to find kind of what these unique um, definitions of rural may be. Now, obviously, that doesn't help us very much with surveillance restrictions, but I think it helps us to understand where the limitations are in different measures of, of rurality, for example, and, and when they're used, what, 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 what's slipping through the cracks, perhaps, potentially. So, I, so, I, so for me, um, it's about you know, more of the transparency of what, what measures we're using um, and, and what they do and don't tell us more so than necessarily trying to um, come up with a holy grail of a, of a clear measure of morality. Um, and, and with that, I mean, again, with the, our work that, and, and, and a lot of the work that we've been doing recently has come off, come from this Health Matters project that, that, um, that, that finished up, um, 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 last year, but still has some ongoing um, pieces to it, um, and, and um, um, that was a you know a NC State uh, led project uh, here in North Carolina uh, with four counties, predominantly rural, um, you know, uh, funded from the CDC. Um, Annie um, Hardison Moody with the College of Ag and Life Sciences was a fantastic uh, project leader on this, and, and uh, it's a great collaboration between College of Ag and Life Sciences and, and the College of Natural Resources here at NC State. Um, but you know, it, the, one of the, the projects and, and, and again, um, getting to another call to action, the partnership aspect was really exciting to be able to partner with extension with, uh, some of the health uh, partnerships are already established in some of these rural communities, um, and bring some other, uh, folks to the table, uh, really was exciting to see some of the activities being, uh, being conducted and, and some innovative things. And we've talked about this before, you know, in rural communities, uh, have the the vast potential for innovation and uh, creativity and and pulling um, you know capital from 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 unique places and so to see some of these um, you know projects emerge was really exciting uh, but the, the the one the, the one the baseball program I think you mentioned is <laughs> one of the more interesting uh, aspects that, that that through the qualitative research um, on that really led to some, some interesting findings that, that I think um, are may, maybe not surprising, but it's interesting to see them come out and emerge and, and research. And, and, and to, to give some backstory, um, there was you know, in a small town's uh, recreation com commission decided to restart a, um, a youth baseball league. They'd had baseball um, in, in the community for a long time. They saw this as an opportunity to engage uh, the youth in the community, they had park space, which 
uh, was being uh, under you uh, underutilized, um, you know, set right, right to go. They, they did a lot of things right in engaging with the community and, and sort of providing uh, a local uh, individual that was going to lead the, the, the program that had a lot of um, trust built in the, in the community. And, um, and so um, uh, kids came out, they didn't. Um, and so this was, this was kind of cool. They started in a little league uh, just like it was back in the, in the good old days. And, um, and they didn't know how to play um, baseball. So they adapted the program. They, they, they turned it into sort of an instructional league to try to build the skills in the kids. And, and so uh, we actually wanted to highlight this as a success. And, and so we, we, we sort of designed the study to, to do some interviews and sort of talk about what were some of the things they had done right. And when we came back, they found out the league didn't come back the second year. It had failed. Nobody, you know. Did. And so we found some really interesting things about how um, you know, basically the sort of unique uniqueness of rural communities and particularly the scarce resources that are available and how they were being used and how they, uh, and, and something that looks very, very different than, than a more urban um, community. And, and it's not to say that urban areas have a, abundant resources. It's just that, that they don't quite have the same scarce communities that have very little uh, industry um, um, sort of supporting some of these programs like they've had in the past. Um, the, uh, you know, the real threat of nostalgia that, that came out in terms of wanting things to be like it used to be. And so um, there was a, it was a very uh, clear focus that, that it wasn't, uh, you know, what, what do we do, need to do for the kids today? It was like, well, if we just can get back to where it used to be, a lot of that driving some of the decisions. Um, and, 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 you know, and again, um, it, it was, it was, it was interesting. And so, so the, the, the positive side of this was going back and talking to people in this community. Uh, there was a real sort of, um, you know, a lot of nodding heads and yes, this sounds like uh, some of the challenges we've come up with. We we're sort of being driven by, uh, you know, whether this nostalgia, whether it's the fact that we're, we're sort of, um, because we don't have a tax base, we're reliant on grants. We're reliant on wherever the money can come from. And sometimes that money's driving, um, you know, decisions. So for example, um, you know, getting a uh, USTA tennis grant to, to, to build tennis courts in a community where nobody plays tennis. There wasn't even a tennis racket to be found. So, you know, is that, you know, the best approach uh, in these communities that, that, that really need more engagement, really need more sort of partnerships, really need more ground up uh, kind of uh, capacity building. Uh, there's not going to, as we, you know, there's not going to be one size fits all for, for rural areas and rural communities because everyone has some so many individual challenges that, um, uh, and so so the qualitative bit of this and the community-based participatory research bit of this, uh, I think, really sort of uh, has given us a kind of a, a direction and hopefully uh, a, a focus for this this particular community uh, as part of this project to uh, plan, plan hoping to do a needs assessment with the community for the first time ever. Um, so, so it's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a, you know, an interesting, <laughs> I think if, if we travel to the rural areas, maybe I know this in West Virginia, sort of secondary to some of the opiate issues and, mm -hmm. you know, maybe work that's temporary and then you have to go away for two or three weeks. Um, it seems like that generation of 25 to 40, for lack of a better term, they're missing. So, so maybe sometimes we're getting the nostalgia of the people in control, the six, you know, over 50, 60, 70 year olds. And yeah, it's really interesting to see that. So um, yeah, I appreciate you telling us about that. I think maybe we'll wrap it up with one more thing. And that is um, just thinking about partnering in, in rural communities. If folks haven't done that before, who do you, you mentioned extension and, and uh, ag, um, I think ag and life sciences at NC state, but who else, um, maybe in your travels, have you seen that uh, what other organizations are stable kinds of uh, organizations or groups are, are key to work with in rural areas in your experience? Uh, I would have to say faith-based organizations uh, are, are probably one of the most prominent. Um, and, you know, we've seen some real um, exciting and innovative activities and, and, and facility use and shared use and, and programming uh, coming through some of the faith-based communities. Um, you know, I, I have some of my even early work in rural Western North Carolina seeing, you know, transportation, because as we know, transportation is a big, <laughs> a, a big issue in a lot of rural communities. And so sure. using church vans to, to get 
you know, kids from schools to homes so they can do an after school program. Um, so faith based organizations have been a big one. Um, I think, I've, um, you know, one of the, the sort of more recent um, kind of um, exciting uh, innovations is the university healthcare systems that are starting to um, branch out into some of the smaller communities. And so we're starting to get some of the, the university partnerships on the healthcare side um, that have, have helped with some, um, you know, some physical activity interventions and things like that uh, and, and help to strengthen some of the partnerships in those communities. Sure. Um, so, yeah. I, and, 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 you know, um, you know, there, there's some stable, um, you know, um, partners. Uh, sometimes you get some surprising and unique housing um, um, sort of um, um, a s organization in a uh, small town that wanted to, you know, really renovate some of their facilities for physical activity. And so partnering with, with them um, was really, uh, was really unique, was really interesting. So I, I think it, uh, there's a lot of partners there. A lot of times they just don't know, um, you know, how to, how to start a partnership conversation. And so somebody, uh, whether that's through extension or someone else can, can really um, get some folks to the table. Awesome, Mike. I think uh, we're going to wrap up. So I really appreciate your time. I know you're very busy. Yeah. Um, you have a nice view from your uh, back, uh, back deck yeah. there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that'll do it. That's a wrap on episode two. So, Mike Edwards, uh, thanks so much for your time. All right. Great. Thanks, Christian. This feature is brought to you by JPH MP Direct, the companion site of the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice. To learn more about the research presented in this talk, visit us online at jphmpdirect.com.